Hello, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds on this Monday afternoon. Thrilled to have you all with us and pleased to welcome our special guest, Dr. Michael Polisi, who, as you probably know, is a professor of urology at the Icon School of Medicine and the chair for the Department of Urology here at Mount Sinai, Beth Israel and downtown. He's also the director of minimally invasive uh, urologic surgery for the system where he specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of kidney, ureter, adrenal, bladder, and prostate disease, established the robot surgery program at the Mount Sinai Medical Center back in 2004, um, has done 5,000 cases, over 5,000 cases for various kidney disorders and helped pioneer its use in kidney cancer and kidney stones. Um, he's the author of multiple book chapters, more than 100 articles and abstract. He's an in internationally uh, recognized lecturer, and so we are delighted to have him with us today, Dr. Polisi. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Uh, it's always always great to talk, especially when it's home homegrown. And uh, you know, this this is a lecture that uh, I have uh, given in various variations of it before to uh, some of the geriatric people and in board review and things like that. So uh, I wanted to make this uh, a lecture that's that's a little bit less formal and more sort of interactive because you know prostate cancer screening is is really uh, has changed so much over the last twenty years. And obviously, as internists, you guys see this uh, daily. Uh, and so, you know, there's always no question there's there's some controversy that uh, we can certainly discuss. And, and I'd like to bring that to the surface a little bit. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, hopefully, um, you guys can see this. We're good. Yes. All right. Perfect. Great. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about screening and early detection of prostate cancer, uh, and then maybe go into some of the options for prostate cancer, depending on what sort of the time is. Uh, and again, you know, I want to leave some time for questions as well. And in between, if someone has something to raise their hand or, or just interject, that'd be great. So uh, what are some of the objectives of our lecture here? We want to obviously talk about who's at risk for prostate cancer. What's that, what's that subgroup? Are there benefits to actually screening, uh, given the controversy behind screening? Um, who should be screened, since this is an extremely, part of, uh, extremely important part of uh, the screening process, and how should we screen? Uh, finally, like I said, we'll, we'll also discuss or touch upon some treatment options for prostate cancer in general. So what exactly is the prostate? Well, so that's, that's always the multi-million dollar question. No one really knows what it's for. It's an accessory sex organ. Uh, it's an exocrine gland, exocrine gland. It gives off a, a certain portion of it uh, to the ejaculate and liquefies the semen. And basically what it there, it's there for is just to create a lot of heartache for men uh, with various different conditions, including prostatitis, which affects between two and four million men a year in this country. Uh, BPH, which if you can argue, arguably say that every male, if they live long enough, will get some type of BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia. And the same goes for prostate cancer. So this is sort of the nemesis of the male gender uh, that, uh, you know, we as urologists have to see contend with all the time. The clinical importance of the, pro of the anatomy, the peripheral zone is the area where majority of cancers are found, about 75%. That's where the rectal exam uh, can be helpful. Obviously, when you do a rectal exam, it's also controversial by itself. Uh, you can feel for certain cancers, some nodules on the prostate uh, when, you, when you do that rectal exam. Uh, as you know, we're only feeling a very small portion of the prostate. The exam itself has actually fallen out of favor dramatically over the last uh, 10 years. And there's plenty of articles to suggest that we probably shouldn't even do rectal exams for prostate cancer anymore. Uh, and so actually what you'll see a lot of your patients when they go see urologists, quite often they're not even getting these uh, uh, rectal exams anymore, unless there's a reason to do that for, you know, uh, looking for prostatitis or because someone comes in because they're told to have a, an abnormal exam and things like that. But it's not routine anymore in the screening process. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit, in a little bit as well. The transition zone, well, I'll show you here. This is the area that's around the urethra itself. Uh, that's usually where BPH starts, but we'll find about 20% of cancers in the transition zone as well, uh, particularly when men undergo TERPs. So, so traditionally, when men went under terp, underwent TERPs about 20 years ago, we'd find a, a subsegment or some, some, um, some pathology that showed prostate cancer. And we, there aren't as many TERPs being done anymore. So the reality is that we just don't diagnose prostate cancer in the transition zone as much as we did before. Uh, we do diagnose it with prostate biopsies and the occasional TERP as well. So um, 
moving forward here, why is prostate cancer important? Well, it accounts for uh, more than in more than half the countries of the world, it's the most frequent cancer diagnosed. So there are plenty of di- plenty of uh, prostate cancers around the world, obviously in, in, in the US as well. And if we look worldwide, it is one of the leading uh, or the most uh, diagnosed prostate cancer, most diagnosed cancer. It probably in the air in the areas that's not the top is probably just as underdiagnosed just simply because of the screening processes that just don't exist there. Prostate cancer is the leading cause of cancer among men in 46 different countries. Uh, certain countries, we've seen a dec- uh, decline towards the number two position, but it's always number one and number two in most countries of the world. The percent of new cases by age group, the majority of cases are diagnosed in men in their mid-60s, 66, okay? The ones we care about the most, obviously, are the ones that we find here between the 45 and 65-year-old. This is accounts for about almost 40% of all cases. So we do need, that's the group that we're always looking to to identify because that's the group that has the most longevity and likely to succumb to prostate cancer, metastatic prostate cancer. So that's the group that we focus a lot of our attention on when it comes to treatments and when it comes to screening and things like that. The average age for men when they actually die of prostate cancer is about 80. That's the median age. But we obviously still see it in the younger generation, uh, 45 to 75, uh, still accounts for about 30% of deaths. So you need, that's, what, that's the group, like I said, we focus on the most and we want to avoid uh, progression into metastatic or, or, or prostate cancer death. You have a first degree relative, so father, brother, uncle, your relative risk for developing prostate cancer is two and a half times. If you have two first degree relatives, so let's say two uncles, two brothers, whatever it is, it actually goes up exponentially to almost eight times as much. So important fact, an important piece of information when you do do a screening to find out who's got, uh, who's got prostate cancer in their family and who doesn't. Risk factors also include our racial risk factors. No question being uh, uh, African-American descent, you're gonna have a much higher risk factor for get, not only having prostate cancer, but also dying of prostate cancer. Um, there are different psychosocial, socioeconomic, and certainly genetic factors that are involved in that. And so no question you'd have a lower threshold for our African-American patients. And in fact, when you see urologists nowadays, it's one of the first things that most of us do is, is, is have a much lower threshold for going after or looking for prostate cancer in this, uh, in this in, in this uh, racial profile inherited genetic mutations risk alleles the BRCA2 gene has become very important or has become very has, has gotten to the top for prostate cancer we've seen an eightfold increase when people uh, when men show up with a BRCA2 uh, mutation uh, other mutations that, that uh, are also uh, seen including uh, the SMPs um, we keep this in mind when we're doing this especially nowadays that we're, we have uh, uh, a a better way of identifying. So obviously some of our genetic testing allows us now to kind of subcategorize patients where they may or may not be a uh, higher risk for developing prostate cancer or not. Um, so how can we affect cancer mortality overall? So obviously number one is prevention. We want to look for, to look, look to see, look to remove carcinogens, environmental exposures that can cause cancer. So obviously smoking sensation, diet, exercise, these are all things that we look at and the general uh, rules that we ask for patients to, to avoid. Um, besides prevention, there's also screening as a secondary prevention. So obviously looking at PSA, colonoscopies, uh, mammograms, these are all things that can help. Treatments, these also improve uh, cancer mortality over time. And so obviously, you know, the, the better the treatments, the better the improvements that we have over for prostate cancer. So we look at all the cancers again. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the sort of the, and we see this across the board, not just in prostate cancer, but over the last 20 years, we've definitely seen a good decline in some of the major cancers. For instance, lung cancer in men, we saw a decline starting in the 90s when the amount of smoking started to decrease. Women as well, they started smoking a little bit later than men, but also started to see a decrease over time as, uh, as the sort of the uh, prevention started to go up that we should stop smoking in the national campaigns. Prostate cancer, obviously, we've also seen about a 52% decline in prostate cancer. We'll talk a little bit more detail about how that came about and why that's important. Colorectal cancer, with the advent of colonoscopies and, uh, and surveillance protocols, we've also seen about a 53 to 57% decline in both males and females uh, over the last 20 years. 
um, breast cancer, with uh, heightened awareness with mammograms and screening. We've also seen a decline over the last 20 years. Same goes for uterine cancer and stomach cancer as well. So, you know, there are, re there are reasons to do all the screening. There are, we've, we've seen this now in the last 20 years and all across the board in most cancers that we have mass screening. So this is, this is definitely the protocol we want to do. Well, why screen for prostate cancer? We know that prostate cancer seldom produces symptoms until it's incurable. So meaning late stage, higher stage cancers, metastatic cancer, that's usually when patients show up uh, with, with um, uh, symptoms. Prior to that, in general, most of these prostate cancers are, are, are asymptomatic and they come in for various different reasons, whether it's because they, they've been told to come in uh, routinely or because their PSA is up. So relying on symptomatology is, 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 not so, is not so accurate. Current methods cannot accurately distinguish between tumors that will progress slowly and will progress symptoms versus those that will likely cause suffering or death. So not all prostate cancer is the same. We don't know which ones are the ones that are going to cause an issue down the line or which are the ones that you can live with and certainly can, uh, you, you can die with, so to speak. Uh, the vast majority of prostate cancers do fall into that latter category, but because there's so much, it's why that still ranks as one of the highest mortality rates uh, for cancer in the world. Well, therefore, since we don't know any means of preventing or curing metastatic disease, the sole hope for reducing suffering and death is through early detection and appropriate and effective patient management. So let's look at what our screening protocols are. So PSA, prostate-specific antigens, a serum marker for uh, adenocarcinoma and also just for the prostate in general. It was discovered in the, in, in the late 80s and was then introduced as a screening marker in the 90s. So this is an interesting uh, sort of uh, story as to how this uh, came about. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, different, um, the different protocols here uh, have changed dramatically over the years. PSA itself is a glycoprotein produced by the prostate epithelial cells. It regulates the degree of liquidity for seminal coagulum. It regulates motility of, the, of, of sperm, and it presents in low serum levels naturally. So every male, you're going to find some PSA. It's just a question of what level. The things that can affect PSA, the most common, of course, is BPH or prostate enlargement, prostate cancer itself, prostatitis, sexual activity, trauma, instrumentation, all these things can affect the, the PSA levels. And so these, this is also something that we keep in mind when we ask patients to come in for their regular PSA levels. So we ask them not to, we ask them to avoid intercourse beforehand. We ask them to avoid things like bike riding. Uh, if it becomes down to that, we really want to monitor these, these PSA levels. So let's look at the history of PSA testing. Prostate cancer mortality in men, uh, once it was isolated in the early 80s, we had a, a fairly high uh, mortality rate. Once the FDA approved its use in serum testing, we started to see a spike uh, in prostate cancer. Wide screen, uh, widespread screening uh, begins in 1991. And then suddenly over the next 20 years, we see a dramatic decline in prostate cancer mortality. So that's great. You know, we see an age adjusted prostate cancer mortality decrease by 53%, resulting in 80% decrease in the proportion of patients with metastases at diagnosis. We see 45 to 75% of this decrease is attributable directly to PSA screening, or at least we believe it to be. Okay, and it's been sustainable and uh, over, the, over the period that we, we were studying that, that 20 years. We also see it's one of the top, uh, uh, it's one of the top cancers uh, in the world where largest reduction about three to 4% per year, more than any other cancer. And also has the largest reduction, not just in the US, but also overall. So should we say this is a success? Should we say, wow, we did a great job. We've done an awesome, uh, have an awesome screening program that uh, men uh, were discovering prostate cancer. Look, we've decreased mortality by 50%. So we raise our hands and say, wonderful. Well, actually the US Preventive uh, Service Task Force came out in 2011 and recommended about routine testing of PSA. So why did they do that? So they basically came in and said very clearly that they absolutely cannot uh, proceed with, uh, uh, with, that we should not be using PSA at all on a routine basis. And this threw everyone into a big tizzy and I'm sure in the, in the internal world, this is what happened. I'm sorry guys, one second, one second. Okay, everyone see me again? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so here we are. Now we've got this major organization uh, telling us that we should not uh, routinely uh, use PSA. And so, what does that? Where, where did this come from? So the the fact that we have mortality, the decrease in mortality, 
one of the questions that came up was, are we diagnosing or over-diagnosing patients? Um, are we over-treating these patients? And in fact, when we look back at, at uh, what happened over during this period of time, yes, we probably were over-diagnosing. The vast majority of men were being treated for prostate cancer when they probably didn't need to be treated. Obviously, the treatments, not only for biopsying, but also surgery and radiation had enormous side effects that could be long-term and, and could cause a lot of issues. Um, there were also the overdiagnosis created things like psychological distress. Uh, the biopsy itself could lead to bleeding, infection. We have men who have prolonged prostatitis. And so at what cost are we, are we decreasing mortality and, uh, and what's, what, are, what are we really doing here in the end? Um, studies, you know, we know that the PSA is not perfect. There's a poor sensitivity, about 35 to 70%, a poor specificity, about 60 to 90%. And if we're lucky, you know, the, the traditional cutoff of 4.0 is not exactly a, a traditional cutoff anymore. So we, we, that's also tr th thrown things into tizzy. What causes this, this, these effects? And so what we have to look and, and go through these different uh, variables and figure out what the next step is. Screening reduces prostate cancer mortality, but with an offset reduction in the quality of life, okay? Um, every time that we uh, diagnose a man with prostate cancer and we are trying to reduce mortality, we're, we're also giving away a certain amount of quality of life. And so we have to balance that, that difference here between quality of life and, and what are we really doing. There are three large randomized trials for PSA screening that I'm going to go over into brief detail for each of them. Um, there was one with the European community, the ERS, ERSPC. The, uh, there's a Gothenburg uh, trial, which is a subset of the ERSPC. And then the PLCO, which is the American trial for prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian cancer. And so we'll talk a little bit about why these uh, trials are important and why they help shape a lot of what we do with prostate cancer screening. So regular PSA screening every two to four years in the European ERSPC reduced prostate cancer mortality uh, during the time period that we were looking at. We saw a screen group of 29% less likely to die from cancer, 38% for those when they went 10 years or more. So on the surface, this looks great. So men that are being screened for prostate cancer were definitely uh, reducing the amount of mortality that they have. And so everyone was, throwing, everyone was patting themselves on the back that we're doing a good thing. Uh, we went to Sweden and Gothenburg in particular. So in Sweden, if anyone knows anything about the Scandinavian countries, um, a lot of these screening, the, the screening just didn't exist. Prostate cancer screening just doesn't exist up until uh, the 90s. Uh, and so what happened is the, uh, uh, the Swedish government came in and said, no, we're going we're to go ahead and start doing, we're going to start screening, which means that within, two to four year, within a two to four year period, every male got a PSA. That then prompted then biopsies or treatments, wherever they needed. And so this was a very clean group, but considered a great group to look at. So the control group versus screening group, we saw an absolute risk reduction of, of, of 52 with a 66% lower rate of advanced stage prostate cancer and a 56% lower rate of prostate cancer mortality rate. Now, the problem with this is you needed uh, to actually prevent one death, you need to screen at least 231 men and had to find disease in at least 10 of them to be able to prevent one prostate cancer death. Numbers aren't terrible. And when we go to the PLCO, remember this is the American study, we really see that suddenly screening didn't do anything. So we see that the, the amount of men that, uh, that, that got screened versus those that didn't get screened, we actually see it's exactly the same. So we'll talk about a little bit what that means and why, why that's important for this as well. So this is what actually prompted the U.S. Uh, Preventive Task Force in 2012 to stop using PSA. They basically said, look, there's plenty of evidence here to show that we shouldn't be using this. If anything, you actually be creating more harm. So we just have to stop altogether. And that was in 2011. So by 2015, we were starting to evaluate patients. Men were coming into the office and urologists and were being seen. And we were starting to see that where a lot of our men were getting were being diagnosed with much later stage cancers than they were before. So men were showing up uh, with distant metastases, both in the younger generation, the 50 to 74, and also the older generation. So you, clear, you see this clear kind of uh, um, uh, curve going back up as the screening rates went down. The average percent of men who underwent PSA screening in 2008 was about 61%. It dropped to about 50% in 2016. And so then we did see a commensurate increase in the average men who were diagnosed with prostate cancer uh, at that time. So that's something to think about. So what were the criticisms of the U.S. Preventative Task Force? Well, one of the problems was that the US, uh, US PSTF panel had no urologist, radiation oncologist, or medical oncologist on this training or on this, on this panel. What they did is they used 
<coughs> they used the PLCO uh, study as one of their main studies to, to uh, state that they didn't want, that this was the, uh, that the abnormal screening results would undergo, excuse me, this, they used the PLCO uh, 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 trial to basically state that this was, this was the absolute way that they shouldn't go forward because of the fact that there was no difference. They also incorrectly assumed that every man with abnormal screening results would undergo biopsy and then all men diagnosed with prostate cancer would undergo definitive treatment. Prostate, uh, prostate cancer screen trials were completed prior to active surveillance, which is also something that we'll talk about a little bit later. This is a, uh, a, a very common method that we monitor or, or, or evaluate men. And, and, and it's a legitimate way to treat prostate cancer or, or as, a, as a subset for treatment later on. So the most important criticism of the US PSTF is that it's, it was heavily weighted towards the PLCO, which was the, treat, the American treatment. Now, during in the PLCO, like we talked about, there's basically no difference between those who were screened versus those who weren't screened. Now, part of that is because in American uh, medicine, pretty much everyone got PSA, all right? So if you were an, in, if you were, saw an internist or you saw a urologist, whether you were in the study or not, at some point during, your, during the time that you were seeing doctors, someone got a PSA in you. So the problem was that our control groups were totally contaminated compared to our uh, groups that we were looking at. It's very different than the European groups where we had a pure control group that really didn't get a, any PSA screening at all. So we were sort of a, a, a unfortunately, this was almost a, uh, a, 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 we were victims of our own success here in the US in the sense that we had such widespread screening that we couldn't even get a, 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 a pure control group to really get a good, a good study going. So in May of 2017, after looking at all this data, the task force backed away from its grade D rating and started recommending uh, that clinicians should inform men about prostate cancer screening between the ages of 55 to 69 about the harmful benefit, about the potential benefits and harms of PSA screening. And in fact, uh, when we went back and looked at re restatisize the, uh, the PLCO and ER ERSPC trials, we found in fact, there was still a, a reduction in these groups that those were screened versus those who were not screened. So most prostate screening recommendations, whether it's the American Urologic Association, the NCCN, the ACS, USPTF, the ASCO, everyone has now uh, a recommendation that's very similar or, or close to similar, which you start between the ages of 45 and 55, you continue once, uh, once every one to four years, you stop at around age 70 if the life expectancy is less than 10 years. And then you obviously expand that over time, depending on sort of what the physiologic age of the patient is. Not so much the clinical age, but like I said, the physiologic age is, is actually the important part here. So what are the five golden rules for prostate cancer screening? And so we, we can certainly talk about this in a little more detail. But number one, obviously consent. You wanna have shared decision-making with your patient. You wanna make sure you go over exactly the pluses and minuses of doing uh, prostate cancer screening. Uh, some patients, uh, it makes sense to do it, some it doesn't. And so therefore we wanna always go over the, those, those uh, pluses and minuses with them. Don't screen men who won't see benefit. Why, who won't see benefit? Obviously the men who will probably have a life expectancy less than 10 years. And so that's where this arbitrary number of age 70 comes into play. I have patients in their 80s who still still come in, uh, get their PSA screening, simply because this is something that they they want to do. They've had uh, they they have their father who also comes in with them who's 105, and so there's reasons to think about doing this in a certain population of men. Again, it's not an absolute cutoff, but in general, anyone with a life expectancy less than 10 years, you probably shouldn't screen anymore. Men ages 71 to 75, obviously this is the group that we should talk and have an informed decision-making about whether or not to, to do the PSA testing. The 76 and year older, again, goes back to do, what are we really doing? Does it really make sense? Uh, PSA surveillance can continue as long as the man has sufficient life expectancy to benefit from the treatment. It should be based not on chronolo chronologic age, but rather, rather physiologic assessment of life expectancy as we just discussed. So the last three uh, rules, don't biopsy without a compelling reason, don't treat low risk disease, and you have to treat refer to high volume center. This is actually one of the more important rules of, uh, uh, of screening. We found there were over years, the last 20 years, as we've started to become more and more adept at kind of creating these centers of excellence, that patients that undergo surgery and treatment for prostate cancer have better outcomes when they're at high volume centers. Uh, Mount Sinai, obviously, we're one of the largest high volume centers in the country. 
And so we, what, what that does is allows your the best outcomes, potential outcomes for patients, and also allows a lot of patients who potentially would not require surgery or would not require radiation treatment to potentially go on things like active surveillance and other treatments that would avoid uh, unnecessary, um, uh, unnecessary uh, side effects. So what do I do? I mean, most of my patients that come in, I obviously we talk about shared decision making. Not everyone in age 45 to 49 uh, gets a, a PSA, but certainly we talk about it. Uh, we risk stratify and 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 look at the man's age, health, and prior PSA. Uh, we won't screen men who won't get a benefit. We don't biopsy without it. We recommend active surveillance for men with low-risk prostate cancer. When I say low-risk prostate cancer, this is the group that has Gleason scores of six or seven with low volume, less than five or ten percent. Uh, our biopsies, the amount that we do, the actual number tends to be very low. And again, we want to keep them in, in the high volume centers. Okay, so what are the other things we can do to improve upon uh, besides looking at PSA? I'm sure some of you use things like uh, a free and total PSA or PSA velocity, PSA density, the 4K score. These are all other ways or modalities to sort of substratify what's, uh, what's a better way, uh, what's another way to look for uh, prostate cancer. Unfortunately, there's no consensus on using any, any of the PSA modifications, many ongoing studies to op optimize PSA evaluation right now, but there is no one winner in this group. And so that's something to keep in mind. Um, I use them. I personally like to use the free and total PSA. Uh, it's, uh, it's one that you can use uh, between when men have uh, glee, uh, sort of PSAs between four and 10. It gives you quite a bit of information, allows you potentially to, to, to guide a man into deciding whether or not he wants to do a biopsy or not. MRIs have also become very popular. We have these three Tesla multi-parametric MRIs. Um, they're, uh, they've come a long way, certainly in the last uh, five years. Uh, with you know, Their sensitivity is about 89 to 90%, specificity is about 73%. It enables targeted biopsying with an MRI ultrasound fusion. Um, I'd be curious to see if uh, in, in internal medicine, you guys are using this at all as a standard thing, but this has become sort of a standard practice in urology. Uh, so if any man, before they undergo biopsy is one of the, it's one of the first things we do is actually look to see if we can get a three Tesla MRI. Um, insurance companies were pushing back on this for many years. Uh, we've seen in the last 12 months that, that that's changed. So it's becoming more and more the standard of care to do this. Um, once you actually have uh, or have identified an area that looks uh, suspicious, and again, when I say suspicious, we rank the uh, suspicious areas on, on, a, on a, something called the PIRADS, which is a, a, a radiologic term for uh, whether or not there's a high risk or low risk for prostate cancer. In general, ones and twos, we don't really do much with. The fours and fives have a high likelihood of having some kind of cancer. And so therefore, those are the ones that we <coughs> preferentially go after. Um, the targeted biopsies do show that the, uh, men will like we're, we're much likely to find higher grade disease and also to find disease in general. Um, and so that's 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 one of the reasons that we do this. Now, the problem with the downside with using the MRI is that, uh, you know, there's a lack of consensus to defining abnormality. So there's a lot of variation between who's reading it. Well, that's changing again because now there's that we, we've now figured out ways to to streamline this. Um, we're putting more needles in the prostate, of course, because we're taking many more specimens when we do this. So therefore, you get a higher detection rate. But, also, but that also leads to higher costs, not only for the MRI that we're doing, but also the multiple biopsies increase the cost for, for doing the, the prostate biopsies. So there are some pluses and minuses for doing this, although at this point, the, the majority of urologists will use this as part of their normal sort of standard of care. So shifting gears here a little bit about the treatment of localized prostate cancer. Why don't we, why don't we if there are any questions about active surve uh, about surveillance or PSA screening, why don't, why don't we talk about some of those right now? And then I'll go into a little bit about treatment of localized prostate cancer. Okay. I order anything? Um, so from team 17, um, so... So team 17 has a question about like um, when to gain consent, when gaining consent, I mean. So team 17, if you can like, uh, like uh, unmute yourself. So they are asking, are you talking about, only talking about when the patient has symptoms? Oh. Yeah, so, or general uh, PSA screening for everyone. So Team 17 is asking, when, like, would you offer, like, screening? Like, 
So they are asking if you are offering to everyone as a general screening or like when the patient has symptoms. So, so I mean, I think, I think screening should be offered to every male between the ages of 45 and uh, 45 and 70. Uh, that that's correct. Um, and, and at, certainly men who are at higher risk for having prostate cancer. So obviously men uh, who have come from a, high, a strong family history, uh, men who are certain racial backgrounds, uh, men who also have uh, uh, obviously PSAs have been drawn that, that look, look high. No question that screening, uh, screening is, is important and should be part of the normal armamentarium of what we do. But that being said, not everyone should get a biopsy, not everyone should be treated, but that's part of the, you know, that's part of the art now of how we do this. Okay. All right. So now that now that we've sort of talked a little about the PSA screening and, and, and screening in general, let's talk about a little bit of the localized prostate cancer screen. I'm not going to go into too too much detail about all these things, but obviously the the uh, the five sort of major treatment options that we do have for men with localized prostate cancer includes radical prostatectomy, which has changed a lot over the last uh, 20 years. Radiation therapy, same thing. Uh, external brain radiation therapy, brachytherapy, which is seat implants, and then, of course, active surveillance or watchful waiting. Um, the interesting thing is all these modalities are pretty much are very similar uh, if you look in the first five years, and that's actually just, again, a, a, uh, a function of what prostate cancer is and how prostate cancer evolves over a period of 5, 10, 15 years after diagnosis. So, one of the things is this obviously not just only about shared decision making for the screening process, but also for the treatment process. There's, you know, I spend a lot of time talking to patients when they've been diagnosed with prostate cancer. What are sort of the next steps? What do we do after we've diagnosed you? And so we want to risk stratify first to localize prostate cancer. What exactly are your risks? Are you, you have very low risk? Yeah, you have a, so there, it's defined as four different categories, very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk and high risk. So the people who are intermediate risk and high risk, these are patients that uh, are almost certainly going to require some kind of treatment and some kind of uh, follow-up down the line. They may require not only localized treatment, but also some type of systemic treatment. And so these are the people that we want to sort of target when we're, when we're talking about these things. So with radical prostatectomy, uh, most of you are aware that uh, the, the standard of care now has become to do these uh, robotically, and that's been the standard of care for the last 10 years. Uh, previously, this was done through an open approach, a laparoscopic approach, and now done through a minimally invasive approach or something called robotic assisted laparoscopic prostatectomy or RALP. Uh, the idea being that uh, we want to impart less blood loss, a quicker recovery, better visualization for our patients, and uh, hopefully uh, better nerve sparing, improved potency, improved continence. And in fact, we're seeing that. And part of that may be that the robotic approach, part of that may also be the fact that we're now uh, very much pushing patients to, to go to centers of excellence people who do a lot of prostate cancer, not just, you know, five, 10 cases a year, but really who are doing hundreds of cases a year uh, and, and therefore can impart that benefit of experience and, 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 uh, and, and volume as well. Um, in fact, when we look at, you know, are we really helping patients uh, who undergo prostatectomy? There was a wonderful Swedish study a number of years ago looking at patients that underwent radical prostatectomy versus watchful waiting. And we saw that the rel relative risk of uh, dying from prostate cancer goes down pretty dramatically when you had radical prostatectomy, not only for death, but metastases, local progression, the need for hormonal treatment and other palliative treatment. So you know, across the board, it looked like this uh, prostate prostatectomies really were, were doing a, a good job. Now, the problem with these, some types of these studies, again, this is a Scandinavian study. Uh, most of these cancers were, of course, uh, higher stage cancers, T2 or more. The average PSA is about 13, it's about double what most US screen cancers are. Uh, and this is a very non-diverse population, mostly a Scandinavian population. So let's take a little bit of grain of salt uh, of what the results were, but it does show that there is some improvement when you do these, uh, these, these procedures. Now, when you look in the US, again, we had mixed results when we looked at uh, radical prostatectomy versus watchful waiting. So these again, men who are treated for uh, prostate cancer through a localized treatment with surgery again. We don't see as dramatic a, a difference as we did with the Scandinavian study. And so a lot of a lot of people were sort of wondering, are we really doing uh, our patients a favor by doing uh, radical prostatectomy? So death from prostate cancer is overall pretty uncommon, especially for low risk and low PSA disease. And in general, most men, when this study was being done in the early uh, in the 90s to 2000, were getting we're getting prostate cancer treat surgery for low risk 
low, low PSA disease, which is one of the reasons why we always talk about not treating this group. We want to treat patients who have a higher grade disease, much more like what's in the Scandinavian countries. And in fact, there was a poor cruel for the U.S. Uh, study, um, mostly because they couldn't find anyone to go into this study. So again, in the U.S., you were told you had prostate cancer. You're either going to go into a watchful waiting arm or you're going to get surgery. Most patients didn't want to be in the study like this. And so in fact, a lot of the patients that, that they chose to be in the study tend to be pretty unhealthy to begin with. And so there was a higher mortality than expected in the, in the, in the uh, control group uh, as well as in the prostate cancer group. So again, depending on who's, which study we're looking at and which uh, modality we're, we're, uh, uh, we're, we're pushing. These are things that we always have to keep in mind. Radiation therapy has been around uh, for the last 40 years. Uh, it has definitely evolved uh, in the last 20 years for where it's much more precise. The types of side effects that I used to see when I was a resident, uh, I just don't see anymore. Things like hemorrhagic cystitis, hemorrhagic prostatitis. These were sort of commonplace uh, when I trained. They're very, very rare now, which is great, so, which means that uh, you know, we're, we're much better at developing or uh, delivering the radiation to the areas that we wanted to. Uh, Angiogen deprivation therapy or hormonal therapy, such as Lupron to reduce the amount of testosterone in the body. We've also been very good at uh, um, uh, uh, selectively giving that to patients who need it versus who don't. Uh, in general, uh, we give uh, about six months of treatment along with radiation therapy for the intermediate risk and those with high risk, we do much longer, about one to two years at the very least. Brachytherapy uh, is another term for radioactive seeds. This was very popular about 20 years ago. It still exists today. Uh, one of the reasons it's popular is an ambulatory surgical procedure. It's done in a, in a couple of hours. You basically place a bunch of these radioactive seeds into the prostate uh, and, and do this by measuring out exactly where, how much radiation you want to give to certain parts of the prostate. It helps to limit, <coughs> excuse me, limit exposure to the rectum and the bladder. You can give very high doses or very uh, or moderate doses, depending on sort of what you want to do. Quite often, we'll combine this with uh, hormone therapy and extra marine radiation. And even with high-risk disease, we actually have very good results. And in, in fact, that, that is the preferential way to treat high-risk disease in many men uh, to this day. Quality of life post-treatment, uh, prostatectomy, obviously the, 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 the three things, or the, 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 the two biggest things that we worry about uh, is erectile dysfunction. We see anywhere from 46% of erectile dysfunction in men who undergo prostate, prostatectomy surgery and up to 20% in, uh, of incontinence at about two years. With the robotic error that's changed a little bit, we're, we're starting to see erectile dysfunction has declined more than about 25 to 30% incontinence rates as well probably closer to 10 to 15%. That may not be so much a function, again, of the fact that it's done robotically, but the fact that it's being done in, in, in centers of excellence and where people who really specialize in this area of prostate surgery are doing it. Uh, radiation treatment as well. Uh, we always have to be careful about some of the quality of life issues there. Erectile dysfunction is very much uh, uh, something that can occur. It may not occur within the first uh, year or two, but usually by the five year, of, we call it the five year delay. At the five year mark, it's about the same as what we see with, uh, with surgery. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things that I counsel patients on. If you're trying to avoid erectile dysfunction issues, uh, radiation may not be the way to go. That still can occur even in, the, in, the, in these patients. Uh, irritative uh, symptoms, incontinence, uh, lower urinary tract symptoms can be very common with, uh, with radiation. Uh, bowel injury, radiation proctitis can occur. Radiation cystitis, again, these are things that I don't see as much as I used to, but they're obviously still, uh, still can occur. And, and, there's, and there's quite a bit of uh, uh, concern about secondary cancers, both for bladder and rectal cancer. It does increase uh, uh, in, in this population of patients. Again, more from the old uh, uh, radiation that was being given. And we, we hope that in the, in the future, within the next 10, 20 years, we'll, we'll start to see a decline in these sort of secondary cancers that can occur. Um, people have tried to con uh, compare RALP or the robotic prostate prostatectomy versus external beam radiation uh, uh, therapies. It's a little bit like uh, comparing apples and oranges just because of the different ways that we, uh, we monitor and how we treat. Um, you know, younger patients, we try and push to do surgery. There's a, there's a much more tangible result with it. We have pathology to look at. Uh, we have a wonderful way to monitor whether or not there's recurrence. That's just using, looking at PSA versus in radiation treatments. Uh, that we don't really have that, that, that much of a, uh, uh, we don't, we don't have that, um, uh, uh, that luxury. Um, older patients, uh, those that, uh, certainly have quality, uh, certainly have, uh, 
um, morbidity issues, we tend to push more towards radiation. Uh, these are the ones that are going to have a better sort of uh, quality of life. Certainly, if they're if they're you know we're worried about the incontinence and, and things like that, quality of life certainly can be enhanced with uh, with radiation in this particular group. How about watchful waiting versus active surveillance? Watchful waiting has, has been sort of equated with benign neglect. Uh, this is, these are patients that are less than 10 years or a lifespan of less than 10 years. These are the ones that are likely going to be in palliative care. Active surveillance has become much more commonplace. We probably, on average, put about 20 25% of patients on active surveillance. These are patients with low risk cancers uh, with the intent to, to cure over progression. Uh, so that we do, when, when, when patients do go into this group, they do require more PSA screenings, more rectal exams, more repeat vibes, and things like that. Sorry, one second. One second. Sorry, guys, give me one second. Sorry, guys. This is, the, this is this is the issue of doing this in the, in the operating room. You know, you're constantly being uh, going to ask to help here. So, um, and, and um, so let me just let me just finish up here. Um, so, what's the good and the bad? You guys see my uh, my slides here? I'm sorry. No. Um, okay. Let me let me share the screen here again. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I don't see it. Oh, no. Now no. you don't. Sorry about that. Yep. Okay. So what's the bottom line with all this? Um, the future of prostate cancer is going to come down to screening smarter and treating better. So what we say by that, PSA is not a reliable marker for prostate cancer, as we talked about. There are risk stratified screening and biopsy protocols that uh, we can enact. We have newer biomarkers that are coming into play, including genomic testing, PSA modifications, and this era of prostate MRIs will help to avoid many, uh, hopefully so, uh, quite a few biopsies in the future. And we also wanna treat better. We wanna reduce overtreatment. We wanna identify low risk uh, patients who can go into active surveillance or watchful waiting. We wanna, we wanna also uh, make sure that patients that do get uh, treated, that they're gonna have a 10 year uh, prostate cancer survival uh, that's in, in, in greater than 90% or more. Um, and, you know, we want to treat prostate cancer as a chronic disease. You know, there are newer therapies coming out all the time for advanced disease, and this is important to, uh, to capitalize on that. So with that, I'm sorry, guys, I, I wanted to uh, finish up here. I'll take any questions. And again, I apologize for the, uh, for the back and forth here. Excellent. Thank you so much. This was a great talk. I know, um, I'm sure there are lots of questions out there. I know there was one question in the chat um, about whether a patient needs a further test if a transabdominal sonogram of the prostate shows a heterogeneously enlarged prostate. So uh, short answer to that is no. <laughs> um, an, ultrasound, an ultrasound is really a nonspecific test for the prostate, but the only thing that you're going to be able to tell with that is, is the size. Uh, you're not going to be able to tell anything about risk for prostate cancer, not going to tell anything about uh, whether or not someone needs to be screened or not. Um, that's going to come down to all the other things we talked about, uh, the actual PSA, the, uh, the, uh, the um, risk factors the patient may have, uh, including family, race, things like that. But certainly ultrasound is not something that, that I would use for a reason to screen someone. So maybe I'll interject a question here. Um, you talked about four not being the sort of limit anymore. Uh, can you talk about where, what cutoffs we should be worried about and, and does PSA velocity play a role in that? And what if they're on a five alpha reductase and like, how do you, how do you make sense of the numbers? Sure, no, absolutely. So, so I, I didn't touch upon that, but, but that, cause that's a whole lecture by itself, but the, <laughs> the, uh, you know, we look more at the trends and like you said, the PSA velocity is, is important. So uh, one of the first things we do when someone comes back with a quote unquote, a high PSA, we repeat one. That's the first thing you do. So if, if because quite often, as you know, PSA can go, uh, can, can, can be up for lots of different reasons. Um, and we want to look at the trend of these numbers over time. Um, if we are concerned about it, the next step is to do a three Tesla prostate MRI. Uh, that is, that is kind of the, probably the most 
most uh, definitive or, or, or most helpful of all the tests you can possibly order at this point. Um, there are some patients that uh, are still not convinced over time. And so there's lots of other things. We've tried something called the exosome D uh, study. And, and, uh, and ba basically the only way to know for sure whether someone has prostate cancer is actually doing a biopsy, as you know. What about the flip side where their PSA is only three, but it's been you know, sort of steadily increasing. Do you wait till it gets right. to four? So, so, no, you're absolutely right. So, so it's, it's really the trend, like, uh, like we talked about, it's not the, the absolute cutoff. So if someone's been r running around a one, 1.5 uh, PSA and something goes up to three, then clearly that's one of the issues, right? That, that's, that, 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 that's someone that needs to be evaluated and should undergo an MRI. Other questions from the floor? Thank you for a great talk, Dr. Felicia. This is super helpful. I'm wondering when we offer the screening to patients, I think one of the things I like to talk about is the, you know, procedure and, and what, what we would do if there was an actionable PSA. Um, I guess, can you talk a little bit about in these studies, how they measure like erectile dysfunction and, and bladder incontinence? Because I guess I wonder that those things are sometimes common in an older population anyways. How do we attribute that to the procedure? So that's great. So, so there are standardized um, uh, sort of tests that we do. Uh, there's something called the SHIM score that we look for erectile dysfunction, uh, the AOA symptom score that all patients get. So no question that there are ways that we can do that sort of look at before and after. And you're absolutely right. We, we have to factor in age uh, and, and, and look at sort of the long-term issues. But there are standardized tests that we can do nowadays to actually define that. Uh, and, and, and no question, that's also part of the, when, you, when we do these studies, it's one of the first things that we look at too. All right, guys, I'm sorry. They're actually calling me in the OR for a little bit of emergency, so I actually have to sign off here. So sorry about no this. No problem. Thank you so okay. much for, for uh, making some time for us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, guys. Apologize again. Thanks again.